Okay, so welcome back to the second part of lecture five today, parallel algorithms and data structures. In the first part of our lecture today, we had the general idea of a parallel algorithm reviewed. We go beyond a little bit what we had in terms of simple collectives, but also see that the collectives are very interesting when we have simple application problems where we have seen a vector addition, for instance, or a matrix vector multiplication, where essentially just by having a couple of collectors from MPI, they're making our life very easy. They can scatter arrays, they can gather arrays, or we can even perform with a reduce operation, essentially uh, already some trivial small computations alongside when I still gather the data from the other processors. Also here and there you have seen some more advanced parallel algorithms. And of course, this will be something we reveal in the second part of a lecture series much more when we dive into the, all the different domain specific sciences, which is one of the challenges if you talk about parallel algorithms, as we also had in the first part of our lecture today. Um, we not interested of having just good MPI code. We want to have good MPI code combined with good parallel algorithms in the domain specific sciences. Right, so there's no point of making it beautiful for MPI when we impose, let's say, a big communication burden on the application and it really doesn't work. If we break the physics, which are basically a fundamental paradigm of the simulation that governs the idea of the application. So this is all something which um, needs to be, of course, addressed. Now, in the second part now based on this, we will look again in parallel algorithms, but of course, from a different perspective. Here we're much more interested now in the workload, in the data, what happens to all the variables and how I communicate this again to my neighbors if I have a domain data composition. Many of these things we have already established in earlier lectures from the theoretical conceptual perspective. For instance, in lecture three, there was a lot of how we can break a big problem into smaller parts, but now the idea of the second part of this lecture is bringing all of these pieces together. So you learned about MPI which is more about implementation. You know about hollow regions and ghost layers. You know about domain decomposition of Cartesian, or maybe we have much more interesting ones that we will reveal like in trees. So we see more and more how all of this comes together. And also I will try to get some of the theory that we had, let's say, if you remember about Gustafsson's law, for instance, and load imbalance a little bit, put into the perspective, also addressing communication overheads, and then um, an idea also how you can have, let's say, instead of many, many of the same messages again and again over the wire, maybe combine them in a so-called MPI derived data type, we will talk about also. So in a way, a very data oriented lecture, but many of them have their roots in very traditional approaches. And this is one of them. This is one approach where we start very early on with. Um, really to understand the key essence of parallel computing, where we said we want to have the maximum of the array. We have 16 elements and we can divide, if we have CPUs, let's say, with four cores available, we can divide this nicely in parallel chunks and have the local maximum from all of these chunks computed in parallel. This is something what we want basically with different workers to do. You see here an exemplary uh, illustration how that actually looks like when you do this from an abstract notation. We also notice that the big problem here is somewhere at the master that has to actually break it down into the few. That's why we call it the master worker parallel. The master is responsible for essentially three things. It's breaking this big thing into the small. That's number one. Number two is communicating with the workers. And then, of course, interestingly enough, you have seen this here also. The third is collecting or getting the result back from all of your workers in order to get, let's say, from this big problem, then the solution. So, but this is something what we had in divide and conquer all over in computer science. So it's not really a magic paradigm. So I think it becomes clear, but it also needs to, you know, done in a real way, which is uh, also sometimes challenging. It is sometimes that even we have some problems of just applying this. As you see here, it's an idealized idea that basically to do this, we have equally time. But essentially what we miss out here is that this takes time as well. And for the master, that takes time as well. 
So, and while doing so, one plays the master maybe, he has more work to do. So we talk about load imbalance, right? Let's say the worker one would be at the same time, let's say um, uh, some, some worker that has a very trivial time to solution, while another is taking longer, this would be load imbalance between the workers. But we also have the load imbalance that we see between the master and worker, because in the end, all of them would be one MPI program, right? So I have a core here, a core here, core here. That's why this is a bit misleading. There's another core that needs to be also then, for instance, doing this max global or basically putting this into the small and communicating with all the workers. And of course, then the master can become a bottleneck if you always communicate. And again, think about our scaling idea that maybe we don't want to do this with four, we want to do this with N workers. So meaning high number of scale. Here, the question mark is if a master worker paradigm really can scale, let's say to 200,000 um, MPI processors um, that are or processes that I really want to use. So of course, the answer there is essentially not really. I need to have a smart, uh, basically, paradigm for this. So in the end, it seems like a very trivial approach to do parallelization. And as a parallel algorithm, in terms of the data structures, however, it's also, let's say, relatively straightforward to do. Um, the only problem is here that basically the idle workers, if they have a very trivial task, but there are mechanisms in place that basically you can have work stealing if you have, let's say, more um, work there than workers, so they can actually get more new tasks once they're completed tasks. Depends, of course, how you implement the master to really give then essentially the tasks out to the different workers. A key problem, of course, is also the resiliency. So what happens if one of the workers maybe fail? Do you want to start the whole program again or do you have just another worker you send the task to? All of this sound very trivial, but if you have it in a large MPI application, it can already lead to some load imbalance, which I will also allude to basically in the next couple of slides. A very popular um, approach to parallelization is also pipelining these days. So where you have basically different operations and that actually operate on different pieces of data in turn, so that you have one pipeline that you see below here, where the data is actually flowing through different stages that do something with the data. So essentially it's flowing from left to right with a sequence of stages which are well defined. And each of these stages may be one processor, right? Which is basically doing something with this different data. And it's a one way communication channel here, but this is the idea of pipelining and also popular applied. Another very popular one, which I also will use here for obtain a lot of lessons learned and elements which are related to parallel algorithms, data structures, and also the Harlow regions is the geometric decomposition. It feels so natural. Um, <clears throat> I think everybody of you can really realize this. You have essentially here an example of the whole, um, you know, Britain, and you want to maybe simulate here something. And if you want to have the weather simulated, you will see if you do it too large, then you work is actually large in all the different tiles, you would end up probably with little parallelism. So this is not a very good idea. So your domain decomposition means it determines the granularity, but also indirectly the chunks of work and data structures and data you have to work on. So essentially here you have now an example where we do it perhaps a bit too small, where we now have lots of different data and chunks of work to be completed in each of the different tiles. While many of the tiles don't even get any data because essentially it's somewhere in the ocean that we maybe in the moment are not really interested in. So here you see um, I, uh, the, that the granularity really affects the chunks of the work and the data in this domain decomposition, but it also shows you that essentially what we want to do is to, to make a parallel algorithm in that way that we have not so much communication and as much as we can in a way computation but of course leveraging the parallelism which is there again the idea is to have um, minimized communication which means if you have such a small domain decomposition and we would have let's say the weather that is somehow still affecting the local neighbor tiles if a wind is going over these tiles in that direction then you need lots of different communications and by having so much different tiles 
You need lots of communication. On the other end of the scale, this might be, let's say, a bit too less communication in the sense also to less parallelizable um, fractions of what you do. So that also doesn't make sense. Um, however, here the computing would be very rich, right? Which is in a way our idea to maximize a computation that can take place either in this tile and then every now and then you just have some exchange basically with your neighborhood tile. So this is of course a trade-off that you see here. There's nothing that is really giving you a concrete, uh, concrete picture how you exactly have to do it. It depends on your application domain problem. So what it still means in order to do and think about data structures and the domain decomposition, you also have to think about the granularity of your problem. <clears throat> then also what we had in one of the last lectures was the idea of ghosts and halo regions, right? Which kind of replicating the zones that you have directly alongside that you see here. Essentially, this is my core tile. And these are the artificially parts, which are basically then already reaching into the idea of the other, um, let's say, processor that I don't see in my current time step, right? So I always get something updated. We call that a, basically a data or hollow bulk swap of information. And this could be lots of physical properties, as I said, wind speed and wave height in the ocean. Again, the idea is here clear that this halo represents something which is just used for communication. And hence, it depends again how big you actually form those. Um, also here, it kept CS is that every little processor doesn't, is not necessarily always doing it at each of its own way. So usually you would have an iteration with some predefined intervals, and then you send this kind of swap data in bulk, not really each processor on its own. Right, to prevent also again load imbalance and to keep the simulation, uh, let's say, to a manageable degree together. Um, also, when you send many small messages, this might be much more far greater overhead. Uh, and this is something where the MPI data types later in maybe comes also in. You always send instead of having a one big message exchange, which then clarifies a lot of stuff that you don't have to exchange again and again. And this brings us to this data structure exchange, which really matters. And if you have this hollow region that we already explored before. And in one way, it is basically always like this iterative methods as an example, maybe that you can consider where we said the time step now affects my next time step. So I would have the computation phase of my current time step. But then, of course, I need the hollow communication phase, so to speak, for the next time step to already inform the other processors and to get information from the other processors, what I can compute for my next time step. <clears throat> and this is something what we will also come back to later when we have some more examples in lecture seven, for instance, where we then think about more how this works with stencil methods and hybrid codes and so on. So I think in a way that's very clear what we can look then also maybe if we have this interesting geometric implementation, we can also now look a little bit on things which now hampers this beautiful world. Because in a way you think now, well, that's not difficult to do. We have hollow regions. Um, what's the problems here? So the problem is that you in many cases have an input domain or an application domain you want to simulate or detect, as you see here in the Mona Lisa, which is not equal. So here it's a good example already what we had on the slide before. You see these are two tiles and they are hollow regions or ghost layers around it. And here's a computational complexity, right? That's what I compute inherently. But when I want to now have the wind over the, over the tile and I'm more interested in the, let's say, land cover here, then you immediately can see that actually this process has much less to do than this processor here especially as you know, weather prediction often is a very local regional phenomena. So in this sense, here is not so much to do than here maybe with different hills and so on. So um, that's something to consider. We call that kind of a load imbalance. And the same is true when you think again here, the idea of maybe here an AI case where the detection um, or essentially a kind of parallel code just want to detect some features here in this kind of picture. Just to explain that if you have big chunks, what that can also have an influence on load imbalance, 
right? You see here a tile in the, let's say, coarse grain parallelism, um, which has almost nothing to detect, just background noise. While here, this tile is very busy detecting nose, eyes, and maybe other artifacts, um, basically, on the in the skin. So this is a very tough idea of doing domain decomposition, where you think, again, the same applies that we had before. It's too large, maybe, little parallelism, and the computation complexity is extremely unbalanced. Of course, this could happen also when you have, let's say, here the idea of this, let's say, smaller, where you also can overdo this maybe by doing it smaller and smaller and smaller. But here you have, of course, similar things. Even if you have a smaller domain decomposition, you're not safe from the load imbalance, right? You still have the problem that here is just background noise, while here maybe you want still to detect parts of the nose at least and parts of the eye. Meaning that um, a proper parallel algorithm needs to take this into account. You really have to think about that this time to solution, whatever you do, the whole execution time of your application is really determined by the slowest processor. It doesn't help if, let's say, this processors here are all quickly done. They all wait for the application to finish if this processor has done its job. They're all in the same boat, as some people would say it, right? In this sense, we also have to think about it to be, you know, basically a parallel programmer. You have a proper parallel algorithm only if you have a really good amount of work equally distributed, which is not easy to achieve as a parallel developer, right? Because there you have to have approximation schemes of the data sets and so forth to consider. And of course, it has also some forms of the data structures, um, you know, inherently and of the application domain problem as well. There are different ways how you can do this. Work stealing is another example again, where basically you can then assign, um, you know, more work to a new kind of processor. Maybe that can, if it's very quickly, you know, finished his work, it has to work on another tile while, let's say, another processor is still busy with its own tile, which can help a little bit of solving the load imbalance issue, but still is not so easy to achieve. Then um, also when you think about putting this a bit into perspective, because now you would think we can always do more and more in parallel, but at some point in time, we also said um, essentially the performance of no matter we do is, is basically limited by the serial part. This was Amdahl's law, if you remember. But the good thing that we also discussed then was the idea that Gustafsson's law had here, um, what you see a little bit, that the more, the bigger the problem is, essentially, you still break it down into different pieces, like here, and achieve reasonable speed up by using, let's say, here, eight processors. But uh, basically, Gustafsson would mean that you here in this context would not just stick, basically, then to eight processors when you have now suddenly 16, 64 available you also would have bigger application problems, right? So then you would have maybe the Mona Lisa in a higher resolution, or you would have, let's say, many different paintings to look at. So basically then the larger application problem, um, no matter how many CPUs you would put here, and if it is a whole collection of, you know, somewhere a museum, uh, the Louvre, whatever it is, where, you know, the images are um, or the paintings are, um, no matter how much you parallelize, it will be still okay because essentially the serial part will have more and more less footprint. I mean, basically you will see it would have less and less footprint, meaning it will be always becoming not so important anymore because your parallelizer part is so high. And this is the idea of Gustafsson's law by addressing a bit maybe also Amdahl's law that of course we have always serial limits, but if you increase a parallel application again and again, then the same, essentially the serial parts become somehow meaningless. That is a very important part. It's often coming into the um, exams, so that's why I spent a bit more time here on it. And I know from experience and lessons learned over the last seven years teaching this, that this is something often misunderstood, especially the difference between Amdahl's law and Gustafsson's law, and also in a way, Again, alluding to strong scaling and weak scaling, right? Think about strong scaling was keeping a fixed problem size, while um, essentially then weak scaling means really having a variable problem size, more and more particles, maybe per core, uh, 
which then alludes to a little bit what Gustafsson's law means, we have to increase just the number of complexity of the application problems. So, so much for this. And um, to show you some more impacts about this on a bigger scale, and maybe also with a different domain decomposition, I also brought you this N-body particle simulations code, which stands for a wall kind of set of problems you really can solve with N-body simulations. So here is something we call the long range interactions or short and long range interaction between different particles that needs to be computed. Um, and basically we are interested in this by having of course more and more increasing particles because usually that means it is more realistic to simulate something. And the interesting thing is instead of having just this Cartesian way um, of how you would parallelize this, you could immediately think when you go in parallel that this interactions itself and the computing complexity of those maybe has some footprint in it. So in other words, um, the question is, if I have my near particles to my red active one, I'm interested in computing with all the different surrounding neighbors in the particles, let it be in space or wherever. This is something where you think about that, ah, the nearest ones are the one I may be most interested in. And I need a tree structure to think of summarizing some of the data particle elements and their data, which is essentially here and averaging maybe and treat them all as one, let's say, particle. But of course, with a more long range interaction, right? Where the short range interactions may be meta to be computed in detail. And then you come to domain decompositions that look quite strange from a certain perspective because they're not any more so Cartesian that you have here a little bit alluded to. And there are different applications using this. And the interesting thing is that here we have one of these solvers, which you really can also use in practice, uh, which is existing. And it forms the Barnett Hood tree code algorithm that we will look in a little bit when you go to this interesting tree code. It's just encapsulated from the real um, application that you have. So essentially we can reuse it for different ideas of doing this with different applications. I said already we had a plasma physics application, but also astrophysics applications with it, and it's still actively used in the community. It has different solvers in terms of fully physics, Coulomb servers, uh, and, and so on, algebraic kernels to work, gravitation. Um, but the point is that the data structures remain the same. It is still a tree data structure, so I do a tree traversal between the different particles, I need to build up my parallel tree first. And of course, what I already alluding to is a good parallel programming um, is always happening with a good load balancing. So we have some scheme and we will come back to this also in other areas where we do adaptive mesh refinement and CFD codes and FEM and so on. So this is always something that goes alongside it and it's a good idea to show that. Also alluding to some previous uh, and basically also future lectures, benchmarking, performance analysis. These are things which are, of course, also important to think about. So again, here we have different levels of this tree where we then essentially can traverse through this tree much more quicker than we would do this essentially then in the Cartesian grid, because here it's really optimized to the interactions where we're interested in, right, where also the physics takes place um, which essentially then breaks down this illustration in, in the different particles on the different interaction scales, really, from the distances. And by doing so and summarizing every now and then there's a tree level, you really significantly reduce the number of particle pair interactions, right, by doing so. And the, in general, computer science trees have been very effective on logarithmic scales instead of having, let's say, other more blocky characters, which then gives you n cube, maybe in space or n square performance ratios. So this is an interesting, beautiful example of what different parallel algorithms exist with different domain decomposition. Here's an example of how you build such a tree where you maybe start with the root of the tree, you have your input domain with all the particles, and then you see that essentially you have this first level um, that you're going to implement here in the root. And this would be, let's say, um, being almost like um, a kind of equal distribution. However, there's one fellow that is already just one particle that we then can use as a kind of leaf character 
And then I subsequently go smaller in this with more interactions, because here there's not so much compute anymore, but those need to compute their interactions. So I have to break this into the smaller and so on and so on. You can see this is how I can actually create a tree which directly has something to do with the interaction. So with the computational complexity that I need compute. And then basically I have here the possibility to treat in different levels of the node, the whole computation on different levels, uh, let's say as a summarizing factor. Then the interaction between of this, of course, is done with known physical laws, uh, which then depends what is your application domain problem. I said already the black hole was one example influencing the gravity uh, field and then, of course, all the stars around it. But it feels really something what is you know, very much specific for different applications. Now, by thinking about these data structures um, from the second part now of our lectures, we came across the very smart idea of doing worker and master or pipelining. No matter what it is, I need communication between the different cores, between the different processors. Um, and they're all distributed memory, so I need to have really data structures, meaning maybe something I know and I have a type of. So is it an integer? Is it a char I want to send over? Is it a float? What happens if I want to send MPI doubles and 10 of them? Should I send receive 10 times to basically do the MPI double? Or can I do not something more smarter? Um, what about arrays for multidimensional data sets? You have seen the particles in space, so this requires already a couple of ideas, at least of different, let's say, locations within the grid to be transported maybe where my current particle location is. It's just another example. Here you have, of course, then the idea of having so-called data types, and that is something what we already have basically used uh, without really taking a long time working on it, that MPI has its own, let's say, basic data types for all the normal variable types we would know from an application. So float, char, integers, right? And they, of course, need to match then um, in an MPI data type what they have used in MPI send and MPI receive and collectives the same way. Then the interesting thing is now that this is basic, right? But what about when we think about more complex aspects that we want to not only send one MPI char or one MPI int over the wire, but a complex data set that maybe represent my particle velocity, my particle location, my particle type. So lots of data, which is in, encoded in different types, of course, always in the end in some of those basic data types. But I want to combine, let's say, all of these basic MPI data types maybe to something like a particle something more complex, which then combines a lot of these different basic data types in one interesting new data structure. And this brings us to this idea of derived MPI data types, the principles around it. So they make it much more efficient in code, right? We said already, instead of sending now 10 times doubles um, with send and receive, we basically send just once this data type. So this send and receive operation is reduced um, basically to just one, although there's maybe more load, so more data to be transferred. The overhead of the whole operation, especially doing it 10 times instead of just having one array of 10, let's say, send out, would be a, a kind of key reduction if you then again think more broadly of scaling this up maybe to many, many cores. The way how that works is usually that you create a new derived data type um, using certain MPI routines that you see here already. Um, when you do this, and we will look at these different types essentially now in the couple of next slides. But uh, once you have done this, um, you basically commit it to the MPI environment so that actually MPI knows about it, right? You can imagine if you now use it in send and receive operations, this new types you commit, let's say a particle, it needs to be more broadly known in the whole environment of MPI. And that's what you achieve as MPI type commit. So in a way, um, you can see a different perspective also in MPI-derived data types of saying it's a map of understanding what basic data types will now flow over the wire, right? So it's much more easier to create this new data type um, than to, to do this. 
And we will do have now basically a couple of those where we go through them, but take away the message that we best explain them probably when we have practical lecture 5.1, so my demos, uh, the next time when we really have a practical lecture again, where I go in MPI and actually demonstrate some of those, not all of them, I guess, from the time, but some of them we will demonstrate. So this really gives you lots of benefits, right? Um, firstly, you can always create them from the basic data types. You can imagine this gives you already quite some flexibility um, that it not needs to be always 10 times double. It could be also one integer and five doubles and one char. We basically don't need to do this repeated sense, which are really, you know, kind of clumsy. It always means you probably have four loops in your application. Um, doing it 10 times, as I said, with a double maybe sent and received 10 times double with a for loop. It is kind of slow and clumsy. And every now and then programmers also do some errors, which is also then a problem. So with this, you also enable then the suitable memory layout, which is another interesting thing to think about. So this is really how you define now this different um, MPI um, types by having, let's say, layouts in terms of contiguous or vector types or index. And let's go into these different types to really understand what I mean by this. So the contiguous, as the name suggests, would say you have essentially an allocation of a data type into, let's say, contiguous locations in memory. Think about that in the end, what you do is you have a buffer you send, if you remember one of the earlier lectures. So you have a certain pointer to this buffer. And what we want to send over the wire would be then this kind of buffer, which has then a certain times of structure. And we can imagine that after this in memory, there should be exactly what we want to define there. Um, here's an interesting idea when we think about now um, a char, it's a very good example because a char is just one, right? So um, this is something which is, normally just one char. But what happens if I want to maybe have, let's say, hundreds of them, right? And what you immediately can think maybe for those which are doing Java development and so on, I created a string. So I have a new string type, which means I just have one time, 100 times char in a contiguous fashion, which is nothing else than my characters forming some, you know, text inside the string. So, this is one idea. And then, you know, sending and receiving uh, means also you have to now edit this new string type, right? That doesn't mean that you necessarily always use now the 100, right? And fill it with data, but you have to account for it and say you have to specify the string type and where basically your buffer then has all the data essentially here and is of size 100 to really fit what you actually have done here in the string type. And by this, you can now nicely work with strings and send them over the wire. Instead of sending, for instance, 100 times in the for loop, we send and receive the char over the wire, right? And this enormously already improves the performance of your application. This is, of course, then something what you can um, do with, with a, let's say, normal um, application, but they are often in, in parallel algorithms also having much more number oriented ideas, or as I was saying, more a vector idea of having different types of data maybe that I really want to use, and they're always the same. So maybe it makes sense to really define a derived data type for it. Again, maybe it would be a particle. Here in the example, it's a good number, which means it's, it's basically lots of um, good numbers which are together created. And it shows you also that you can create, you know, basically this inherent where we say a contiguous of three integers should be a good number. And then the interesting thing is like, you can now reuse the MPI derived data types that you just did here and commit to create another derived data type, which is here in the example, uh, lots of good numbers. Uh, note that this is not any more contiguous. This is now this vector idea, right, of the old type and the new type. And you have here the kind of commands of saying that's where the data is, that's the block length, and then the stride, essentially, that you have to put in. So um, meaning that basically you can now use lots of good numbers 
which is inherently going back to good numbers, but that's what you don't care about because you specify that already as, let's say, a kind of couple of those good numbers in a specific vector type. This is, of course, interesting because you can now combine these new data types and it's getting less and less complex, maybe. Of course, you can overdo it of, of defining too many, perhaps, for every little new addition of a variable, but this gives you quite some flexibility to be used. Um, then a certain other part of it is um, admittedly a little bit more complex when you think about an index type where you want to maybe have, um, let's say, a different array and you just want to have some parts of this array um, basically used. And this is also one of the examples which probably is much better understood in practical lecture, um, you know, 5.1 when we come back to these examples. And then you see what is really meant with the indexed version here of having, let's say, six of them and the array of displacements. So where are they actually inside the kind of whole regions? Um, you see here the displacements essentially tells you three, nine, twelve. Um, but this is also something we come to in the next um, practical lecture more clearly. So. In a way, I just want to also spend some time before we close today to show you the MPIIO again, um, and also thinking about now this parallel file formats we discussed, because that's of course also data structure where you work with, right? Of course, as we said, IO is very similar to message exchanges, so it's not something what you maybe put directly over the wire to next neighbor in the Harlow region. Rather here, we have something what we would put as a HDF file, for instance, on the data storage. So here we're talking more about I.O., but it's also a data structure we have to think about when we do parallel algorithms. So when you think about this, what we did in the HPD scan that we already was alluding to a little bit, we had always this kind of idea of the DB scan algorithm. It does clustering. So basically those um, elements in your data, which are close together, will be clustered together as one cluster. And the DB scan is a very famous one that is, has actually quite nice properties to form, form really arbitrary ideas of clusters. Um, although no bow types, of course, it can determine outliers and noise here, for instance, if there's, let's say, not much in the epsilon and region around it. But the key message to take away is that this cluster needs inputs, right? So inputs in terms of um, really the, the kind of data which is in the domain. And what we do there is also we store this, as you see here, a little bit in in HDF file, files. So the input here is a typical batch script you already know from one of our earlier lectures, a bit more complex because we specify beside the wall time also number of tasks per node. But it's very similar to what you will know. We use the reservation here. It's a hybrid code. So we use OpenMP and MPI in parallel. That's not obvious you, to you, but we'll see how that materialized when we start with lecture six and lecture, let's say, um, seven in the hybrid codes. But essentially, we have this executable, which is an MPI and OpenMP code, but we always use also as an input code here, essentially the HDF5 file, right, and which could be small Bremen data or big Bremen data, and they are encoded in this HDF5 files. Now, the interesting thing is that clustering works on the cluster as the name suggests, and identifies those which belong together to a cluster. So essentially of just not only reading where the location of these clusters to perform, let's say, distance measurement, computations, Euclidean distance or so, to form then these clusters according to the rules which are standing here. Um, you basically also will write down back in this HDF file, basically the identity of the cluster. So is it, you know, cluster gray, cluster light gray and so on. So also this we will look more clearly when we have lecture eight in, of course, but you see that HDF5 is then really used um, uh, importantly also basically in this. And think about what that means. We do a parallel reading, right? So this is not the master worker that you are thinking about, that the master will now load all the data and then we'll distribute it to all the different cores. Here we have a parallel I.O., meaning that all the different cores we assign to this HPDB scan is actually loading in the data in parallel. 
Still, it could be the case, as you know and have seen in the start of this lecture, that we have quite some load imbalance, right? And we go with this with a kind of cost approximation scheme where we then cut the domain decomposition again, just to, as a reminder and a beautiful example again, not where it maybe seems natural to you here in the middle, but where the most computational complexity is. Because as we just learned, this DB scan has to do lots of Euclidean distance computations to see what is the closest one to me to really form a density uh, basically based cluster set. And then we do it locally. And already what we also had at the beginning of this, we have to have to exchange the halos at some point in time, right? To get the idea to the others and see the distance to the others, which are actually hidden on another processor in another distributed memory space. So I again do clustering locally and then basically have then a global picture only by exchanging halos and then essentially have a smart scheme of doing a complete cluster labeling at the end to get this. And but we, what we then end up with is lots of data which we use with HDF5 again and using PAL-IO. All right, so that's really, um, I think, as an appetizer for the HDF data structure. Um, we basically look into this again, as I said, also when we look into this parallel um, HBTB scan a bit more into detail, but you can think that this Bremen data of the inner city that we have once seen are just essentially data points. You see the different sizes here of Bremen small in the HDF5 file, what you can do. And to the best way to understand what basically HDF5 is, it looks like a file system, right? That you already know. You can inside this file system, you have different parts of it, and we will look to it. You can essentially have in the HDF5 file 3D arrays, but also images, tables, and they are all located according to a kind of tree-based or file system-based structure. And they interact, of course, with your I.O. libraries that we have discussed already about um, that we um, basically conveniently can use as a standard in different HPC centers on different HPC machines. Okay, so more on this essentially when we then have also, um, let's say, our parallel ideas of using, you know, this kind of algorithm then inside lecture 10 as a concrete example of how you do hybrid programming, how you do uh, data structures around it, how we represent all of these in the clustering. And with this, I close, I think, this lecture for today by an interesting video that we have here and that also shows the beauty of industry simulation that I left out a little bit being a bit more specifically scientific today. The modern aircraft is an engineering marvel, the epitome of a smart system, an intricate balance of hardware and software technologies operating across extreme environments, performing safely, reliably, and predictably, performing as promised. To reach this level of performance, the aerospace industry demands accurate, fast, and reliable simulation technology supported by scalable and cost-effective IT solutions that leverage high-performance computing as well as cloud and mobile technology to empower robust design methodologies offered in an integrated multi-physics environment, allowing aerospace engineers to collaborate across disciplines, departments, and even continents. Aerospace has led the way with simulation-driven design processes amplified through automation, customization, and a seamless user experience, empowering engineers of all experience levels to truly extend the boundaries of innovative design. They have trusted the most advanced simulation tools for both single physics and full mechatronic system modeling, tools that are accurate, fast, and reliable. The technology, vision, and strategy of ANSYS stand alone as the leading provider of critical modeling and robust simulation solutions for the aerospace industry, enabling our customers to consistently realize their product promise.
How exactly does the aerospace industry rely on ANSYS? In more ways than you would think. Today, fuel and environmental performance have become mission critical in our industry. Starting with engine performance, ANSYS provides critical simulation best practices in the areas of flow path aerodynamics, aeromechanics, thermal design, and combustion processes. Specific solutions include stress and modal analysis, heat transfer for high temperature operation, rotor dynamics, compressor aerodynamics, turbine aerodynamics, and blade row aeromechanics. In reducing the weight of the aircraft, ANSYS provides simulation capabilities for advanced composite materials that are faster than traditional methods and allow for thermal and electrical properties to address the challenge of multifunctional composites. ANSYS continues to participate in industry-leading consortia to advance aerodynamic design. A portfolio of coupled physics enables multidisciplinary optimization to deliver higher fidelity understanding of aircraft performance throughout the flight envelope. With the increase of electronic systems, ANSYS is focused on providing simulation best practices for electric machine design, antenna design, mechatronics, and thermal management. We recognize that with more electronic systems comes the dramatic rise in the number of embedded software lines of code. Through the SCADE family of products, ANSYS provides software that delivers FAA-certified embedded code that is automatically generated. This can reduce the overall time to deliver certified code by 50% compared with manual or non-certified code generation methods. Beyond performance, passenger safety and comfort are paramount concerns for any airline. Whether it's for icing, blade impact and damage, bird strike, lightning strike, or crashworthiness, ANSYS provides a portfolio of technology to support the development of the safest aircraft. As a member of the Cabin Air Reformative Environment, or CARE Consortium, ANSYS is using modeling and simulation to improve the in-cabin air quality and control the spread of disease in flight. ANSYS also provides a suite of aeroacoustic and vibroacoustic solvers to significantly reduce noise, comply with industry regulations, and improve the passenger experience. Highly complex, intricately interconnected, the modern aircraft is a smart system unlike any other, requiring the most advanced hardware and software simulation technologies available. Simulation-driven solutions provided by ANSYS, specifically for the aerospace industry, enable you to realize your product promise. Okay, so that's a stimulating example, which we close now and essentially say this was all for today. The next time we will look into a more practical lecture uh, covering some materials of our lecture four and lecture five that we will see then the next time.